I'm Al Filreis, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends in the world of contemporary poetry and poetics to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of a poem. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for a poem that interests us, some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound archive, writing.upenn.edu slash Penn Sound. Today, I'm joined here in Philadelphia at the Kelly Writers House in our third floor Garrett studio by Bob Perlman, whose first book of poems was Braille, 1975, and most recent is If Life, 2006, whose critical writing includes the marginalization of poetry and whose Penn Sound page includes recordings for many occasions, the earliest Dated, you want to guess, Bob? March 1978, a reading at 80 Langton Street in San Francisco, and the most recent dated October 2009 at the Writer's House. And by Charles Bernstein, who is the author of 40 books, collections of poetry, essays, pamphlets, libretti, translations, and collaborations, whose volume of selected poems to be called All the Whiskey in Heaven is due out this spring, and who with me, I'm honored to say, is co-founder and co-director of Penn Sound. And by visiting us from the left coast, Robert Grenier, whose many works include Sentences, a box of 500 5x8 index cards, and What I Believe, Transpiration, Transpiring, containing unbound boxed 85 by 11 pages of holograph, writings, drawings, and whose senior honors thesis at Harvard in 1965 was called... Organic prosody in the poetry of William Carlos Williams, and, he, and, and Bob Grenier had to apply to write about such a uh, recent, recently dead writer. Um, Bob, <laughs> Bob's newest effort is the much-awaited collected poems of Larry Eigner. Hello to all three of you. Welcome back to Poem Talk, Charles and Bob P. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. And welcome back to the Writer's House, Bob Grenier, and to Poem Talk for the first time. We're Thanks. really glad you're here. So, now, speaking of Williams, today on Poem Talk, we're going to talk about two very short, well-known poems by Williams, as chosen by Bob Grenier. Maybe we'll even decide that they are especially Grenierian, I don't know, and they are The Red Wheelbarrow, a chestnut, classic, and Flowers by the Sea. Penn Sound's Williams page includes eight recordings of Flowers by the Sea, and five, only wow. five, of the Red Wheelbarrow. Interestingly enough, he stopped reading that at performances after about 1952 or so, and he kept reading the other one. Uh, we're going to listen to each poem twice, four different recordings. The first wheelbarrow recording was made at a reading before a convention of teachers in 1942. The second, a rare recording, is from a 1950 radio interview on the Mary Margaret McBride show aired on WJZ. The first, Flowers by the Sea, was recorded at the Library of Congress in May of 1945, and the second was at Williams Rutherford, New Jersey home in 1954. So here now is William Carlos Williams reading The Red Wheelbarrow and Flowers by the Sea. The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow, glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow, glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Flowers by the sea. When over the flowery, sharp pasture's edge, unseen, the salt ocean lifts its form, chicory and daisies, tied, released, seem hardly flowers alone, but color and the movement or the shape, perhaps, of restlessness. Whereas the sea is circled, and sways peacefully upon its plant-like stem. When over the flowery, sharp pasture's edge, unseen, the salt ocean lifts its form, chicory and daisies, tide released, seem hardly flowers alone, but color and the movement, or the shape, perhaps, of restlessness, whereas the sea is circled, and sways peacefully upon its plant-like stem. Bob Grenier, why these two of all the Williams? These two stuck with you? uh, Something you think about a lot? Yeah, stuck with me. uh, uh, You get to a certain age, wake up in the morning, sometime before dawn, and uh, what's to do? And (laughs) after a while, you know, after you've tried to figure out what to do, you 
get passages of of words and they'll come together and then you'll hear a part of a poem, I do, and then see if you can reconstruct it or allow it to return. Formerly, you know, there was some attempt to try to remember the poem. You know, you'd try to, you'd read it and then you'd try to so remember it. So this is it. not remembering now, but what? If it's not remembering... The poem is, is remembering me, in a way. It, it's, it's part of you. It's putting me back together uh, in the quiet time of my existence, insofar as I am alive. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's a moving thing to be the place where, that, where those words return. Bob and Charles, um, I was rereading and also listening to Bob Grenier's performance of Sentences uh, at several occasions while thinking about these incredibly short stick-in-your-mind Williams poems, and I kept thinking about a connection between, between Bill and Bob. And I, I know that it's there. I wonder if either of you or both of you would wanted to say something about the connection between Williams and Grenier. Well, I um, certainly remember one of the um, uh, early uh, lessons as a as a, a young poet that I learned from Bob, uh, uh, unofficial but very um, instructive uh, lessons when I was in my early 20s. And uh, also, uh, uh, Bob wrote about this uh, the red wheelbarrow in this one, and I, rem- I I just like Bob is you know was talking about remembering a poem. Well, actually, I find right now that I can remember quite a bit of what Bob wrote in this one. He was very comic about the the, the little tiny um, uh, couplets in the in the red wheelbarrow. Uh, so much depends. He he quoted that and then commented very wryly. Uh, Emersonian moralism, etc. Um, and then um, at the end, with beside the white chickens, uh, he pointed to the to the vibrancy of the short vowels in chickens and and how the this this kind of still life, this minimalist still life poem, suddenly broke into motion. Um, so the the. <coughs> The wordism, the letterism of the poem, the, the even though it's also about that which is real, it can, it sometimes people read it as about labor, as about farming, etc. But it is also about words and about patterning of words, and so I think that's very Grenier-esque. Charles, I mean, certainly "Flowers by the Sea" uh, strikes me as a perfect example of autotelism. Everything else that it is, it is also a poem that is simply what it is in front of you and it, and it has a kind of circularity it is sufficient unto itself it just is and I know that for a long time for 20 or so years that was kind of out of fashion in any English department to say that something could be incredibly memorable because of its autotelism autotelism in fact was a word that the new critics used mm-hmm. so it's really out of fashion anyway and that's it strikes me that Bob Grenier's sentences and other um, bird soundy imagistic and word itself only, I don't know how to talk about it, but I can do it, mm-hmm. aesthetic. Maybe it doesn't come from here, but it's there. What, mm-hmm. what do you have to say? Well, to avoid the mini-lecture that we are, don't, don't do here on Poem Talk, I'd just point to his own self-understanding of a tradition of which this poem fits into. So you could read backward this poem with an understanding of, of Grenier's own readings of, in particular, Creeley after Williams and Zukowski, sort of in between. So you have, similar to what Bob is saying, called objectives. These are not poems about so much a lyric eye speaking, but about some kind of observation which has its own specific fact. Then there's the counting that Bob talks about. So they're both poems of uh, eight, eight lines and divided into two, two stanzas, and each of the stanzas themselves has a kind of specific autonomy to them. I was really struck, you know, spending time with Bob recently and thinking about Eigner with just the second line of Flowers by the Sea, edge, unseen, the salt ocean, which could be a Larry Eigner line just itself, edge, unseen, the salt ocean. And if you just skip lines in the first thing, you get these fantastic perhaps of restlessness, and maybe whereas... And by the second reading we heard, which was a reading done by Williams after his second stroke, so that the words are trippy, 
almost. Um, he he's almost v- voweling them as if for the mm-hmm. first time. That's, Bob, that was the uh, version that I heard uh, in the Cademan recording that s- came back to me, and uh, I think it's better than the. I other. think it's better too. Why would you say and it's I, better though? Oh, I, the, the intonation is a peculiar sort of snotty nasal <laughs> schoolmarmish quality that that I really appreciate and it articulates what's what's said in a way that uh, well, uh, Pound of course said that, that, that William's virtue was his opacity and this poem purports to be you know of the condition of the flowers by the sea but what it's actually saying uh is is uh, 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 in question uh, throughout. And what in the world? So you're gathered into the, the spacey quality of of the ocean being by the ocean, which has been so important to me in in time. Uh, and all this stuff is going on, and then this curious figure is constructed in the end, which is hard to visualize. When over the flowering sharp pasture's edge, unseen, the salt ocean lifts its form. Chicory and daisies, tide released, seem hardly flowers alone. But color, and the movement, or the shape perhaps, of restlessness, whereas the sea is circled and sways peacefully upon its plant-like stem. Well, you know, um, I mean, logically speaking, and logic may not be the trump card in any way here in this conversation, but um, he's saying that the ocean is flower-like, and then he says, yeah. but the flowers are ocean-like. Yeah. So he essentially says, well, this yeah. is like that, yeah. and that is like this, and it yeah. feels like it's yeah. lap. If I feel yeah. like the high tide uh-huh. is coming in. Yeah, it's the sound. It's all this uh, uh, restless uh Perhaps circled peacefully, the sound is is uh, mesmerizing in its capacity to conjure this kind of spacey place by the ocean where these things exist. I yeah. think of uh, H.G.'s Oread used by Pound as his version of the Images poem. Oh, Just yeah. in in the single mm-hmm. line, the sea is circled and sways. The sea is circled and sways, so that has the kind of quality that Al is... Whirl up sea, I think. She, she says, yeah. you know, when Williams performed So Much Depends Upon, maybe it became a sticky thing for him, but he introduced it by saying, I th- this, has been, this is a perfect poem. I don't think I've ever written a poem that was so perfect. And I, I don't know what he meant by that. I wonder what you... In 19... 19- 50 recording the Mary Margaret McBride program. One of the things interesting to me about Penn Sound is the the comments that Williams makes, and he says, as you know, Al. Of course, we have eight. We have, uh, I guess, eight eight uh, eight second versions of this this poem, um, and five readings. He says that it's the same as a thing of beauty, but instead of a thing of beauty, I say a red wheelbarrow, referring to Keats. And Endymion. I mean, that's an amazing comment. He says the first line is a rewriting of Endymion. Same as line. a thing of beauty. I mean, the, 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 the wheelbarrow. Well, yeah. it does, as Bob was saying, and you know, I was thinking in the, in the old days, uh, it's, a, you know, it's an injunction to pay attention to something because of its moral uh, value. Um, and uh, it directs you to what is, in effect, an image in, in, in itself, as an image, and then beside the white chickens, for me, that was the thing that really opened up a possibility of thinking uh, words as being composed of letters as a composition uh, of successive shapes. And it's the sounds of the E's and the I's beside the white chickens. It only happens because of the conjure quality of the of the form. So much depends upon a red wheel barrel. Of course he never reads with, with those rain. line breaks. That's a very interesting fact that we should note. Water in a beside the white Pen sound chickens discussion. Why yeah. doesn't he read the line breaks? People are struck it, by that. He doesn't read it well at all. 
because you you read it with the space in between. I think the the thing of beauty in that poem is well, the second line. Flowers, just flowers by the sea gets read as one would want the wheelbarrow to be read. He yeah, I, no, no, you know I, what that dashed yeah. off phrase that Bob Grenier mentioned the the uh, flowers alone but color or the shape perhaps of restlessness. That interruption gets read. The red wheelbarrow. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow, glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. When over the flowery, sharp pasture's edge, unseen, the salt ocean lifts its form, chicory and daisies, tied, released, seem hardly flowers alone, but color and the movement or the shape, perhaps, of restlessness. Whereas the sea is circled, and sways peacefully upon its plant-like stem. When you came upon this stuff for the first time, how radical, how eye-opening was it? Well, it's you? funny that you should mention upon, because I was going to say that the second line, the single word upon, in the poem of Red Wheelbarrow, and I know Bob Grenier is going to point out that this was originally part of a long serial work, Spring and All, and that it wasn't an isolated poem. But William certainly included it in his selected poems and treated it and as a separate poem. And... It's a very different sense and perhaps in one sense more radical to think of it as Spring and All. I think that also in response to what Bob uh, Perlman was saying, for him the visual spacing didn't translate into durational or temporal spacing, and that, that was deliberate. That was his thought about it. I want to turn the tables and ask you a question, Al. This is your subject, anti-communist, anti-modernism. I mean, two of the comments that Williams makes on Flowers by the Sea, he mentions Max Eastman, and the second time he thinks it's Max Ernst, but he means Max Eastman. And he says, that, uh, sort of in a mocking way, that Max Eastman says that this Flowers by the Sea was the one poem that, that he was credited as writing. It was the only real poem that he wrote. And then he reads it, and he keeps reading it. You know, who is at Max Eastman, and what does this have to do with this poem? Well, Max Eastman, by the time he's performing, Williams is performing this in the 50s, Max Eastman had done a loop-de-loop -loop ideologically, so he was a sort of, he'd become an anti-communist, although he was being treated as if a communist. So he was basically doubly persona non grata. So maybe Williams, in his own clumsy way, was you know, affirming the the outsiderness of uh, of Max Eastman really was the first communist to discover modernism. So that was his claim to fame. But and then I he think became anti-communist and did. also anti-modernist. He did indeed. But he somehow thought this was a real poem for which I don't know whether I can't tell whether Williams because thought was, that was ridiculous as a comment or he I liked know. it. Well, I, I mean, Eastman wrote a, a screed against Stein. Right. And I think that he th this is a, this is this seems to be a poem that's metaphorical. We've just dis mm -hmm. affirmed that it's a metaphor that undoes itself. So it's actually like the wheelbarrow poem in that sense. But I think Max Eastman misunder misread it, and maybe Williams understood that. Bob, short, a short mean, lyrical poem with flowers in the sea in it, so that's okay. Sounds right. Sounds that, okay. That's what I think. I think it's just a kind sort of a, of a funny thing. But he repeats modernism. it twice. So there's something yes. about the fact that he likes its legibility as a something more like a lyric or conventional Well, I, I think in the same spirit, you know, um, Williams went on the road, you know. I don't know why he did it. He was tired by the time. He went on the road, and he had his little shticky introductions for these things. And the wheelbarrow was always introduced as the perfect poem. And I think that that's an ironic statement. I think he's saying basically all you blue-haired ladies out there think that what my poems are is really essentially a laundry list. So I'm going to call this perfect. I don't know. I think his I think his um, late reading comments are just are, are the result of a, a lifetime of feeling uh, deprived of the spotlight. And I think he yes. was glad to have the spotlight. He certainly loved the the laughter that he got. Uh, Bob Grenier. Uh, so you uh, wrote about prosody in Williams at Harvard. That must have been look frowned upon. Well, no, it was the only thing I could do. I had uh, Williams himself uh, was interested in the discovery of form in the spoken word. So he would uh, listen and write down uh, things that he heard, not because people said them or they were particularly uh, you know, important uh, statements, but because there was a pattern of some sort in them which uh, he was researching. Uh, and he was looking for an alternative to, quote, free verse, which wasn't regular meter. And he would find patterns such as exist in this uh, wheelbarrow poem and as you know the various ways you can you can 
describe it. Uh, one is that uh, it, by by syllables, it's four two, three two, three two, four two. Uh, one is a uh, concentrates on, you know, the alternation of the I am upon, and then followed by the trochi barrow, followed by the trochi water, which if you were looking for a perfectly balanced form, might be followed by uh, an I am in chickens. Chickens. But uh, <laughs> the result is, is sort of like, what is that? There's, uh, what is that foot, which is a double stress? It's, it's spondy. a spondy. spondy. But he reads it like a spondy. Yeah. William Charles chickens. Williams says the word chickens like a spondy. Chickens. chickens. Yeah. Chickens. And so it starts to isolate each That's syllable. Funny. As is it a trochee? Uh-oh, we're wrong. Oh, my no, goodness. Spondy Chickens. Is, Chickens. Spondy is not, n- too unaccented. No, no, a spondy is like spoonbill. Yeah, yeah. Jersey. Well, what, yeah, but that's what I'm saying this is. Turnpike. This is spondy. Here and, we are on poem talk getting yeah, it wrong. And pound, Pound's line, uh, characteristically, might, uh, might well uh, commonly would end with a spondy. Uh, uh, I will think of an example. But anyway, what's interesting to me in the form of the poem is that you don't know after the line beside the white what's going to come. And there's something about the balance and the repeated measure in the counting of the poem which uh, frees each next thing to become itself beyond whatever one might have imagined it could be up to that point. So uh, Williams emphasizes the imagination as the constructive element in, in the making of the poem, in the prose and spring and all. And chickens seemingly is constructed out of the form of the poem itself, shaping itself into its next element. It's by this time no longer an imagistic presentation. It never was a description of nature, but it's an invention of a particle of language, two pieces put together, chickens, and they exist in space as if the poet had made them out of nothing. And yet they have the reality of the white chickens which the poem gathers them back into. And I think, you know, a good exercise for for people looking at this poem is to try to replace the word chickens with another word. And which see, is what you did in this one. And see if you can come up with a word which will stand there, which will be there with equivalent constructed materiality. And it's hard to do. I, I, I haven't succeeded. But it showed me that it was possible that the language itself, out of its own internal shaping form, forming capacity, can articulate something which is real, which comes into existence and occupies space. And that's a fantastic thing that, that the words can do, especially if you bring that power of the imagination back to a, quote, contemplation of nature and so that they're not making, quote, abstract sounds for their own sake, but contributing to one's perception of the situation one is investigating. Well, we could talk about these poems and about Williams forever, but let me ask each of you in turn just to say something else about the two poems together or about Williams um, in any way you like, a final thought on this. Uh, Why don't we start with uh, Charles? I would just mention the first uh, line of the third stanza, Flowers by the Sea, again, just pulling that out of the context. But color and the movement, or the shape. I love just that as a poetics uh, for Williams and and, uh, for for the poem. Bob Perlman? Uh, They're so um, different, I guess. And that's uh, something I like very much about Williams is that he um, isn't being the poet Williams, but he does have he, these poems have tremendous autonomy and individuality. Bob Grenier? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer the question that you asked 
on them <laughs> earlier. Um, you didn't get to answer that about well, the, how radical. It I can answer you. that. No, yes. but the connection is b- between me and, and at least a connection. Uh, the Williams demonstrated for me in poems like this, and also the locust tree and flower is another one that so, uh, the second version, like one word, one word at a time, uh, that something which is evidently and calls attention to itself as an invention in the structure of language can also be a way of making a very exacting uh, presentation of what's experienced, perceived in the world, so that the word has this uh, astounding capacity in its own internal structure to name the event that's happening simultaneously and inextricably uh, from, uh, from both of those are, are together in, in a way that you can't pull them apart and neither can exist without the other as writing in any way that's, uh, that, that's moving to me. Wow, perfect. Uh, I, I'll say this now, I hadn't planned to announce it, but our next poem talk will be a discussion of Robert Grenier's sentences. Robert Grenier will not be here for it. There'll be three other people. That's not fair. (laughs) It'll be fun, though. It'll be tremendous fun, and I look forward to it. We like to end Poem Talk with a minute or two of Gathering Paradise, a chance for several of us to spread wide our narrow hands, to gather a little something really poetically good to hail or commend someone or something going on in the poetry world. This is basically your recommendation. Do you have a quick Something we should be reading or knowing about, Bob? Uh, yeah, I can't remember the title. Carla Bilateri's um, new book on cratalism <laughs> in poetry that, yeah. that discusses uh, Whitman, Laura Riding Jackson, Charles Olson, and there's a coda about uh, Robert Grenier. And Lynn Higinian. And Lynn Higinian. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Bob. Charles Bernstein. I shouldn't really do this because it's turning the tables, but given my question about Max Eastman, the the social context we didn't discuss so much about Williams, which I think was very important, is so much discussed in your book, which we don't get a chance to introduce you and your work, and it's a book called The Counter-Revolution of the Word, The Conservative Attack on Modern Poetry, 1945 to 1960, and I think anybody listening to this and wanting to understand the broader context in which Williams or any of the writers from the 50s, 40s uh, uh, 30s were writing should look at that book. Thank you, Charles. And he was certainly red baited, and it's a story that I tell in that book. Well, that is all the white chickens we have time for on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House is a collaboration of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing and the Kelly Writer's House at the University of Pennsylvania and the Poetry Foundation, poetryfoundation.org. Thanks to my guests, Bob Perlman, Charles Bernstein, Robert Grenier, and to Poem Talk's director and engineer, James Lemaire, and to our editor, Steve McLaughlin. This is Al Filrys, and I hope you'll join us again soon for another Poem Talk. <laughs>